We welcome you. Trust you had a good week. How many of you had a tough week? Well, that's you. How many of you had a great week? Only me? Uh, whether you had a great week or a tough week, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord. We want to welcome those especially that are joining us online. And we trust that it will be a wonderful experience as we worship our Lord today. Uh, today, we want to remind you that it is Communion Sunday. And as we uh, talk about Communion Sunday, um, I want to do something different today. And so I'm not sure what's going to happen up here. But anyways, we're going to talk about uh, uh, Communion. And I have a special PowerPoint play uh, for you. It's uh, it's an introduction to the Gospel of Mark. And I hope that you're going to see Mark's Gospel in a different light. Because when Mark wrote his Gospel, they were going through very dark discouraging times. hope to show you that. We talk about us today, and somehow we kind of look at the scriptures, and we lose out the meaning, the impact. And so as we get into Mark's gospel today, I want to share with you the main idea that, that in discouraging and difficult times, there's certain things you need. And uh, you need uh, family, you need encouragement, and you need discipleship. Uh, have you ever tried making a cake without the eggs? Uh, or maybe the flour? Or without the sugar? It wouldn't be cake, would it? Uh, probably be a flat pancake. And, but you need all the ingredients in that cake mix. Well, likewise, we're going through tough, tough times, difficult times. Everybody is. And, I, and I'm talking not just about the, uh, the coronavirus and, and all of that, but I'm talking about uh, it's like wave after wave of evil seems to be coming over our nation and... Uh, uh, and it, it affects everybody. It affects people that we work with. If it affects them, then it will affect you as well. And so for some people, uh, they can be discouraged. And I hope that the Gospel of Mark will become a new encouragement to them. But you need family and you need encouragement because that's exactly what Mark needed in his Gospel. The beginning of Mark 1 says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I want to read Mark 1 this morning, kind of on, but I think you'll begin to see the flavor of the whole letter. Mark chapter 1, so if you want to follow along, I'm using especially this morning the ESV, I think it's a better translation, word for word translation, as opposed to the NIV, which is a thought for thought translation. But Mark's Gospel, beginning at verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I sent my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair 
and wore a leather belt around his waist, and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie and stoop down. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. And the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me. And I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat mending their nets. And immediately... He called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants, and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue, and he was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the, their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirit, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left the synagogue and entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law uh, lay ill with a fever and immediately they told him about her and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her and the fever left her and she began to serve them that evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by the demons 
And the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he, de he departed and went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And they found him and said to him, everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there. For that is why I came out. And he went out through all Judea, uh, Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for yourself the cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in a desolate places and people were coming to him from every quarter. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Father, we pray this morning, O oh Lord God, that Mark, as he spoke under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, did it for his day, for his generation, for his times, and for your people in those days. But Almighty God, now we are in this generation. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and minister to us this morning. May your Holy Spirit teach us. And may it be, Lord, that we would hear the voice of the living God deep within our spirit, and it would carry us, O oh Lord, and energize us, and, and invigorate us, and motivate us to live the kind of a Christian life, even though while we live in these dark, evil days. Spirit of God, we love you this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for your word. Father in heaven, be exalted this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know if you caught on, but what was the key word? And. And. And, and it's not a translation uh, uh, error. It's really from the Greek. I have a Greek Bible here uh, in front of me. And I hadn't planned on, but as I opened this Bible, uh, this was a gift given to me. My wife and I had gone to seminary, and I wanted, we were there to study the Word and to study Greek and uh, there was this brother by the name of Michael. Uh, Michael was not a very studious kind of a guy. 
But one day he says, well, why don't you just use the Greek Bible? And I said, I don't have one. He said, well, buy one. I said, I don't really have the money for it. And Michael went out and he bought me this Bible. And in the front, and he says this, Jimmy, my brother, and don't start calling me Jimmy now. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, my brother, you don't seem to need much stimulus to help you study. So this may serve then as a goad as you consider, consider more practical ways of applying what you're learning. Certainly our Father's word in English too defines our task clearly. I love you in Christ, our eternal Lord, Michael and Kathy Howard, the Lord be exalted. And Michael gave this to me and I put in uh, a lot of time and a lot of work. I don't use my Greek Bible as much as I used to, but I still use it. But it's interesting, but I've got the Gospel of Mark over here, and you probably can't see it, uh, but every time the word Kai, K-A-I, Kai, uh, is used, I underlined it in Mark's Gospel, and I don't know if you can see this, my apologies uh, if you can, uh, can't, but all the words that are written uh, in, in uh, um, are underlined, and the word is Kai. And it's not by accident that this is like this. You go through the whole book of Mark, and he says something, and Kai. And he continues with another story, and. And like after a while, you get the impression and there's something else that's going to happen. And the Gospel of Mark is uh, just an introduction here today. But it's probably uh, structured in, that is so much different than Matthew's Gospel or Luke's Gospel or John's Gospel. And Mark's Gospel uh, has a series of events, one after another, after another. It's almost like, like Mark was in a hurry, and I think he was, to write him down, and, and he would write this one, and, and as he's writing down. And I think there are reasons for that. But in Acts, or the stage one of his gospel, which is chapter one through eight, it is full of ties, and. It's a ministry that happens in Galilee while they're there. And he tries to present Jesus as being the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah. In chapters 9 and 10, uh, stage 2, if the disciples are now leaving Galilee, and this is uh, a private uh, time that Jesus has to disciple them. In the first stage in Galilee, it's a public ministry. And there's the crowds. And the crowds are amazed. And the Pharisees are there in Galilee. But they're so critical. They're so negative about Jesus and everything he says. They're looking for a way to arrest him or kill him. And in those first eight chapters, the disciples don't understand. There's a, there's a, uh, the kind of disciples, they don't understand. And so when Jesus leaves Galilee and he comes down into Jerusalem, Jesus spends time with them because he knows they don't understand. He knows that they're confused about him. But he's training them and he's discipled, discipling them. And he wants them to understand that he will suffer. And so he spends chapter 9 and chapter 10. It's a private meeting. 
The crowds are not there. The crowds are not amazed. Uh, the Pharisees are not there. And they're not criticizing Jesus. But it's just time for Jesus to help them to understand. In the third stage, as Mark writes, he is writing really about the crucifixion and the resurrection. And Mark spends over one-third of his gospel focusing on the uh, mockery, the, the death, the arrest, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus, the burial, and finally, the resurrection. Mark's gospel ends, and it brings a lot of confusion because it ends kind of strange. And some of you may know the argument about uh, the shorter ending or the longer ending. And, you're not and you don't have a clue what to think about this. We're going to talk about that. But there's a reason why Mark is writing and he's constantly saying, and Kai, Kai, Kai. Because Mark's gospel is really set and written during the time of one of the most evil, wicked rulers in the world. See, we are 2,000 years removed, and we don't get the impact of Mark's gospel. Because we don't know why he was writing. We don't know what was going on in their world. Mark's gospel is probably the first of the gospel that was written of the four. Even though Matthew is first. Mark is probably the first gospel that was written in 55. In 55 A.D., this young 16-year-old boy by the name of Nero comes on the scene. Remember when you were 16? I don't know what you were doing when you were 16. I was a sophomore in high school. Thought I had to kind of conquer the world. Well, here was another 16-year-old. He becomes the emperor of the biggest empire in the world at 16. There's a lot of facts of what happens. And for the first five years, Nero is really taught and tutelaged by his mother, Agrippina. Agrippina is a, an evil, wicked, maybe if I say this, you might understand, Jezebel. She's an evil, wicked woman, and she is out to, she's hungry with power. And she's out to rule. But Nero begins to sense that his mother wants too much power. Nero has his first wife, Claudia, killed. And in the process, arranges an accident for his mother to be drowned at sea. But she's rescued. And he sends a detachment of Roman soldiers to supposedly save her. But there's a coup to kill her. And finally, the mother is killed. At the age of 21, Nero becomes uh, incensed with power. He is Kaiser, ruler, lord. He is the, the, the most powerful man in the world. And he begins building all kinds of extravagant buildings and uh, uh, begins taxing people to death. And people start hating him. Meanwhile, they were controlled by a Senate. The Senate begins to 
rebelled against Nero. And they tried to stage a coup to kill Nero. He foils their plans. He's not only wicked, but he's also quite smart as well. We know that in 64 AD, a great fire broke out, like the great fire of Chicago in the 1800s. Rome is devastated. Two-thirds of Rome is burnt. And some of the historians, Tacitus, for example, claims that it was Nero who set Rome on fire. And the reason is he wanted to clear the cluttered houses and build this 100 to 300 acre uh, palace for himself. Can you imagine that? And so some historians believe he started the fire. Others don't. But one thing that Nero did, he began to, began to blame the Christians. And he, during this particular period of time, he used Christians in his own garden, soaked them in oil, lit them on fire so his garden could be illuminated. Whether he set the fire or not, I don't know. We'll never know. We'll know someday. But we know that prior to Nero, there was another emperor by the name of Caligula, who was evil and drove out the Jews out of, war, out of uh, Rome. And a heavy persecution began under Cal Caligula, Calig Caligula. And Nero continued the persecution. Mark <laughs> writes during those days. In 55 AD, we know that probably about 10 years later, Paul and Peter were martyred, murdered by Nero himself. And so Mark begins writing, Mark is concerned. Christians are suffering. Christians are losing faith. And what does he do? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he begins by writing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And, 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 and Mark's purpose is really to encourage the Christians to keep looking at Jesus, to be focused on Jesus, that even though focus on what Jesus did for you, even though while you're going through persecution. Mark's gospel is the shortest. It is the most dramatic. It is full of story after story after story. And, and that's why he keeps going, and, and, and. Why? Because he wants to get to the point. The point is, look what Jesus did for you. He went to the cross. He died, but he was raised to life again. Amen. And Mark knew that not only the crucifixion, the, the suffering, and I think Mark tries to present Jesus as the suffering servant, the servant who came to serve. But he also wants them to see that Jesus is alive. He's not dead anymore. But he's alive. And so with that in mind, Mark writes his gospel. We don't know much about Mark. We know he had a mother and probably a father, for sure. Okay. But we're told that his mother's name was Mary. Not the mother of Jesus, and there were quite a few Mary. Mary was a very popular name in those days. But the upper room belonged to Mary. And so when Jesus was in the upper room at the Last Supper, 
This was Mary's house. And more than likely, John, Mark, would have been there and probably would have looked in to see what was happening. And he was probably familiar with the upper room. In Acts chapter 12, we're told a remarkable, interesting thing. That when Peter's arrested, that Peter goes to the house of Mary in the upper room. It says, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. So Mark, his Hebrew name is John. Mark is probably his Gentile or Roman, I shouldn't say Gentile, but his Roman name, and there's a reason for that. So he is called John Mark, and he would have been familiar with the upper room situation. And maybe he was there that night when Peter came back knocking on the door. We're also told that Mark was somewhat familiarly acquainted with Jesus. Most scholars tend to believe that this is Mark. Mark 14, 51. A young man, they're in the garden. Jesus has been arrested. They've left the upper room. They've come out to the garden. They're in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. They come out. He says, a young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. So if this is the Mark, He's following for whatever reason, wanting to see what is going to happen to Jesus. They seized him. He fled naked, leaving his garments behind. Most scholars believe that in those days, uh, they didn't say, this is the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Jesus. But they were, uh, they didn't need, leave their name, but they left little clues. For example, John's gospel doesn't name himself as the author of John, but as the one of whom uh, the beloved disciple. And you hear that term over and over. More than likely, this is probably Mark who was not only in the upper room at the Last Supper, watching and observing every day, but he also was in the garden. And he, if this is him, he was there. And he saw exactly what happened. Uh, we are told that later in his life, after the death and resurrection and the conversion of the Apostle Paul, that Mark joins uh, Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. They sail out to Paphos. And you know how life uh, at sea can be difficult. They continue and they come all the way to Perga. By the time that Mark is in Perga, which is, I believe, I think, right, uh, right here. Okay? So they left here. They were commissioned. They sailed here came here, came all the way to Perga. And while they arrived there, all of us, look what it says. John left them to return to Jerusalem. He had enough. Enough of this kind of a lifestyle. Enough of going around and preaching to people and telling people about Jesus. Enough of the, this, this hardship, this difficult life. I've got a better home. I can be with my brother and you can be in the upper room and have a, a nice, easy, comfortable life. And so he comes back. But it's not just leaving. It's really a case of desertion. Look what Acts 15, 37 says. Barnabas wanted to take John. This is the second missionary journey now. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him. 
because he had deserted them. John was a deserter. John was a failure. John Mark. And Paul wanted nothing to do with John Mark. In fact, Barnabas says, let's take him. And the Greek text is beautiful. John and Paul said, no. Yes. No. Yes. No. And the scripture says there was such a sharp disagreement with them that they split up. Verse 39 says, Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. Barnabas. Who's Barnabas? He's a cousin. He's a cousin of Mark. Colossians 4 says, my fellow prisoner Aristarchus, or Paul writes this, he, he says, he sends you greeting, as does Mark. Notice this, the cousin of Barnabas. You receive instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. And somehow between Colossians and between the second missionary journey, everything seemed to have turned out okay. Paul is saying, welcome, Mark. He is Barnabas' cousin. And later on, uh, uh, we're told that Mark is associated with Peter. As Peter writes, interesting, we don't have a gospel of Peter. If there should be a gospel, according to Peter, it should be Peter's gospel. There should be a Matthew and a Mark and a Luke and a John and a Peter because Peter was the closest to all the disciples. If anybody really knew and tried to understand Jesus, it was Peter. We don't have a gospel. Why is that? Peter writes down, she who is in Babylon, that is Rome, chosen together, that is the church, the church in Rome, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings. As so does my son Mark. It's not his biological son. It's like by this time Peter is in Rome. And Peter is writing and he says, The church sends you greetings, Peter, to the church. But Mark also sends his greetings. And Mark is like my son in the faith. Somehow in the process of time, right, we're told that Mark was, became very useful. Look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy 4.11. Paul says this. He says, only Luke is with me, the physician. Get Mark and bring him with you. He says to Timothy, because notice this, he is helpful to me in my ministry. Paul sees Mark as being useful, as being a helper in ministry. What happens? Well, more than likely, Barnabas encouraged Mark. And Mark continued in the journey to the point where Mark left off on his own and went to Rome and connected with Paul and found Peter. And there, while in Rome, Peter is preaching. Peter is telling people about Jesus and what happened. And while Mark is in Rome, Mark now becomes a disciple of Peter. He's a follower of Peter. Everything that Peter speaks, everything that Peter preaches, everything that Peter does, Mark writes it down. And this is what happened. And this is what happened. And Peter just keeps on preaching in Rome to the point where finally he and Paul are beheaded. Listen to what uh, Philemon 24 says. Peter says, And do so Mark, Aristarchus, and Demon, uh, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. By this time, Mark is now uh, writing this gospel. 
Mark is seeing the persecution. Mark is seeing the hardships. Mark is seeing the discouragement. And he says that many of them are failing and falling away from their relationship with the Lord. And so he writes this gospel of Mark. This is the early church's view of Mark. Irenaeus, about 130, says, And after their, Peter's and Paul's, death, Mark, the disciple and interpreter of Peter, notice this, himself also handed out to us the writing, in writing, the things preached by Peter. The deserter, the failure, the guy who took off and left them in a lurch. Somehow, now he is writing, taking everything down that Peter preaches. And, and this is what happened. And this is what happened. Kai, Kai. And he writes to us the gospel of Mark. What happened? From being a deserter, a failure, where Paul would come into sharp disagreement with Barnabas? What happened? Something happened to the point where even we're told that Mark was martyred for his faith, for his conviction, because he believed in Jesus. I think if I could um, look it into the mind of Mark very briefly as I conclude, I see something that is so lacking in many, many Christians today. And I think that what was important to Mark needs to become important to us. And number one, that is family. Uh, we're living in dark and difficult times, and the family's so broken apart. Families are falling apart, and they've been falling apart for 20, 30, 40 years. But families are important. Remember your family, regardless of your differences in your family. Stop criticizing them judging them and say, they're my family. And somehow, in the providence of God, I've been brought into this family for a reason. And start restoring the relationship with all of your family members. Some with your parents, some with your children, some with your grandparents. Forget the past. If you're hanging on to the past, you will never reconcile the family situation. They have as many faults as you do. You need family. Families are important. But I think even more important than the family is the church family. Isn't it interesting? We'll see this in Mark's gospel. But Peter says, but Lord, we've left everything. And what does Jesus say that Mark records? He says, but you'll have brothers and sisters and families in this generation. And I think what Jesus is talking about is the church. We have such a poor view of the church because we think church is something we go to on Sunday morning. The church is the ecclesia. It's the people of God who have been called out of the world. And they're struggling as much. And the church is the people of God. And we're that we're by the blood of the Lamb of Jesus Christ. We've been bought together to be brothers and sisters. sisters. And we ought to be committed to one another. But in this day, in this generation, the church means nothing. I'll attend church if it's just something for me. And today, you just don't see that commitment. And when something happens, 
I'm out of here. And there's a massive influx and outflow in America of people coming to church and leaving the church and going to another church. And, and it's, it, Jesus never intended that. Because the church, that's God's people. And we are to be committed to one another. But the problem is people that are not here today, their commitment to Jesus Christ and the church is shallow. Jesus gave his life for the church family. And we ought to be committed to the church family regardless of our differences because of what Jesus did. The family. If there's something else that Mark needed was encouragement. He needed to be encouraged. Maybe he had a nice upbringing in his mother Mary and she had a house and she was fairly wealthy and Mark had a life easy and, and then he goes on a on, on missionary trip and, and he is just discouraged and says, this is the pits. I can't take this. And Barnabas, a cousin, a family member, says, come on, you can do this. Let's go. Let's go. Paul says, no, we're not taking him. Yes, we are. No, we're not. Yes, we are. But encouragement from Barnabas. Barnabas is known in the scriptures as the son of encouragement. And I think that whole time was really meant for Mark to sail to Cyprus and for Mark to be encouraged by Barnabas. If there's one thing that we need today, it's encouragement. Because we're so prone to discourage. No. I would guess the people that are not here today this morning, they're discouraged. They won't tell you. Their pride will say, ah, I'm okay. I'm good. I'll just sleep in today. But more than likely, at the heart, They've lost all courage. Encouragement is powerful. We'll talk more about encouragement in the days and weeks ahead. But there was something else, though, that Mark, Mark was curious in the upper room. Maybe he saw the disciples getting their feet washed. Uh, maybe he, 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 he had a terrible experience on his first journey. After receiving family encouragement and being in touch with godly people like Paul, like Peter, rubbing shoulders with, with you know, one another, and that's where encouragement comes from. It came to the point where one day Peter uh, Mark says, it's not Peter that I follow, but it's Jesus. And I am a matetes, a disciple. The word matetes means a, not a follower, but a learner. I need to learn more about Jesus. And I think the reason why Mark wrote the gospel, because he wanted more, more of Jesus. And not only for himself, but for the rest of the world who are going through dark, difficult times. For them to get to know who Jesus is. Make it your long life's goal to keep learning about Jesus. Because that's really what a disciple is. You see, we're living in difficult, dark, evil days. And what we need we need family. And if it's not your biological family, it's the church family. You need to be committed to one another as God's people and say, I'm committed to you because Christ was committed to me and he died for me. And that's how I'm going to live my life for you. I need encouragement. You need encouragement. But we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. In the weeks and months ahead, we're going to look at Jesus. 
and all the Kai stories and Kai and Kai. We're going to open them up and we're going to look at who this Jesus is. Because if you know Jesus and you understand Jesus, you know that he went to the cross. <laughs> you know that he died for you. And we should be as committed to Jesus as he was to us. And we ought to be committed to one another as Jesus was also. May I encourage you to be committed to the church today. And if you're not going to be committed to the church, don't take communion. Because that's really what Jesus was saying. This is my body broken for you. And the word you is plural, meaning the church. Jesus committed himself to his people. And if he did that, he said, if I am your Lord and teacher, you should do the same. And so we come today to remember what Jesus did for us. His body was broken. The Pharisees continued to accuse him. The crowds that were amazed rejected him. The disciples who did not understand him forsook him. And he did it for you and for me. If you're committed to Jesus today and to his people, may I invite you to come and to eat in his name. Father in heaven, as long as I have life and breath living in me, today I declare publicly, I want to be even more committed to you than I have been in the past. And I want to be committed to my brothers and my sisters because you gave your life for them. And they're important, Lord. And I pray that your spirit, O oh God, would just work over us and, and remind us that we need a church family and we can encourage one another as we keep our focus and our eyes on Jesus. Thank you for what you've done, Jesus. And as we ate this piece of bread, we eat it in faith, trusting you, believing in you, hoping in you that you're the one that will see us through these deep, dark times. Jesus, thank you for the cup. You gave us this cup to remind us of the blood of Jesus Christ. You shed and gave your life so that we could be forgiven. And today, Lord, because by faith in Jesus, we are forgiven. Every sin, O oh Lord, forgiven, cleansed, and we belong to you, Lord Jesus. We drink this today in faith, believing you that you died so that we could have eternal life. We ask this this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. If you're committed to Jesus Christ and his people, shall we drink in his name? Jesus. You were committed. And in the face of temptation to come down from the cross, you endured to the end. 
because you knew that the outcome would be a people who would be saved unto eternal life. And we just say thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you for Mark's gospel. Thank you for Mark. Lord, and I pray that in the days and weeks ahead that we would see Jesus in a new light. May your spirit lead us and guide us. We ask this this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. As they are coming up for the closing hymn, I just want to remind those that are online, if you're watching us online today, God bless you and thank you so much. And remember what Jesus did for you. Maybe you're going through hard times. But Jesus can be that friend that sticks closer than a brother. He went to the cross. He died. He was buried. He rose again so that all of your sins could be forgiven. And today you say, Jesus, yes, I am a sinner. Forgive me. Come into my heart. I want to live my life by faith. I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. If you've done that today, send me a quick note. God bless you. And let me know how we can help you to grow as a Christian, like all of us here are growing as Christians. God bless you. Mark is one of the Gospels that reports that after um, Jesus um, had communion and instituted the Lord's um, Supper with his disciples, that when they went out, they, they sung a hymn before going out. And so this morning, um, we are going to sing a newer hymn of the faith in Christ alone. We have that here on the slides um, for you. Let's rise together as we sing in Christ alone.
Christ, the one who rose from the dead, who stands victorious in victory. May he shine his light upon you. May he guide you this week. May he watch over you and guard you and keep you and hold you in the palm of his hands. Pray your blessing this day, this week, until we meet again. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. May I encourage you that in the weeks to follow, find somebody who doesn't know Jesus and introduce them to Mark's gospel. Bring them to church. God bless you. We've got plenty of room. We can spread out. God bless. Thank you. Are you lost or not? Did you get a new jacket? <laughs> <laughs>